Book Two, Chapter Eleven, of the Lancashire Witches. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Andy Minter. The Lancashire Witches, A Romance of Pendle Forest, by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book Two, Pendle Forest, Chapter Eleven, Mother Demdike. The heavy rain which began to fall as Roger Nowell entered Rough Lee had now ceased, and the sun shone forth again brilliantly, making the garden look so fresh and beautiful that Richard proposed a stroll within it to Alison. The young girl seemed doubtful at first whether to comply with the invitation, but she finally assented, and they went forth together alone, for Nicholas, fancying they could dispense with his company, only attended them as far as the door, where he remained looking after them, laughing to himself, and wondering how matters would end. "'No good will come of it, I fear,' mused the worthy squire, shaking his head. "'And I am scarcely doing right in allowing Dick to entangle himself in this fashion. But where's the use of giving advice to a young man who is over head and ears in love? He'll never listen to it, and will only resent interference.' "'Dick must take his chance. "'I have already pointed out the danger to him, "'and if he chooses to run headlong into the pit, "'why, I cannot hinder him. "'After all, I am not much surprised. "'Alison's beauty is quite irresistible, "'and we're all smooth and straightforward in her history. "'There could be no reason why. So <laughs> "'I'm as foolish as the lad himself. "'Sir Ralph Asherton, the proudest man in the shire, "'would disown his son if he married against his inclinations. "'No, my pretty youthful fair, "'since nothing but misery awaits you, "'I advise you to make the most of your brief season of happiness. "'I should certainly do so were the case my own.' "'Meanwhile, the objects of these ruminations "'had reached the terrace overlooking Pendle Water, "'and were pacing slowly backwards and forwards along it.' "'One might be very happy in this sequestered spot, Alison,' observed Richard. "'To some persons it might appear dull, but to me, if blessed with you, it would be little short of paradise.' "'Alas, Richard,' she replied, forcing a smile, "'why conjure up visions of happiness which can never be realised? "'But even with you I do not think I could be happy here. "'There is something about the house which, when I first beheld it, filled me with unaccountable terror.' "'Never since I was a mere infant have I been within it till to-day, "'and yet it was quite familiar to me, horribly familiar. "'I knew the hall in which we stood, "'together with its huge arched fireplace "'and the armorial bearings upon it, "'and could point out the stone on which were carved my father's initials, R.N., with the date, 1572. "'I knew the tapestry on the walls "'and the painted glass in the long range of windows.' I knew the old oak staircase and the gallery beyond it, and the room to which my mother led me. I knew the portraits painted on the panels, and at once recognised my father. I knew the great carved oak bedstead in this room, and the high chimney-piece, and the raised hearthstone, and shuddered as I gazed at it. You will ask me how these things could be familiar to me. I will tell you— I had seen them repeatedly in my dreams. They have haunted me for years. But I only to-day knew they had an actual existence, or were in any way connected with my own history. The sight of that house inspired me with a horror I have not been able to overcome, and I have a presentiment that some ill will befall me within it. I would never willingly dwell there." The warning voice within you, which should never be despised, prompts you to quit it, cried Richard, and I also urge you in like manner. In vain, sighed Alison. This terrace is beautiful, she added, as they resumed their walk, and I shall often come hither if I am permitted. At sunset this river and the woody heights above it must be enchanting, and I do not dislike the savage character of the surrounding scenery. It enhances, by contrast, the beauty of the solitude. I only wish the spot commanded a view of Pendle Hill. You are like my cousin Nicholas, who thinks no prospect complete unless that hill forms part of it, said Richard. 
but since I find that you will often come hither at sunset, I shall not despair of seeing and conversing with you again, even if I am forbidden the house by Mistress Nutter. That thicket is an excellent hiding-place, and this stream is easily crossed. We can have no secret interviews, Richard, replied Alison. I shall come hither to think of you, but not to meet you. You must never return to Roughley again." that is, not unless some change takes place which I dare not anticipate. But hist, I am called. I must go back to the house. The voice came from the other side of the river, said Richard. And hark, it calls again. Who can it be? It is Janet, replied Alison. I see her now. And she pointed out the little girl standing beside an alder on the opposite bank. You did not notice me afore, Alison cried Janet, in her sharp tone, and with her customary provoking laugh. "'But I seed you plain enough, and heard you too. And I heard Mr. Richard say he would hide in this thicket and cross the river to meet you at sunset. Little pig, they say, are long ears, and mine weren't gin me for nought. "'They have somewhat misinformed you in this instance,' replied Alison. "'But how, in the name of wonder, did you come here?' "'Very easily.' replied Janet. But I ain't a time to tell you now. Granny Demdark has sent me over with a message to you and Mistress Nutter. But maybe you winna like Mr. Richard to hear what I've gotten to tell you. I will leave you, said Richard, about to depart. Oh, no, no, cried Alison. She can have nothing to say which you may not hear. Shall I go back to Granny Demdark and tell her you're too proud to receive her message? asked the child. "'On no account,' whispered Richard. "'Do not let her anger the old hag.' "'Speak, Janet,' said Alison, in a tone of kind persuasion. "'I shanna speak unless you come over wetter to me,' replied the little girl. "'And what I have to say concerns you much.' I, "'I can easily cross,' observed Alison to Richard. "'Those stones seem placed on purpose.' Upon this— Descending from the terrace to the river's brink, and springing lightly upon the first stone which reared its head above the foaming tide, she bounded to another, and so in an instant was across the stream. Richard saw her ascend the opposite bank, and approach Janet, who withdrew behind the alder. And then he fancied he perceived an old beldame, partly concealed by the intervening branches of the tree, advance and seize hold of her. Then there was a scream, and the sound had scarcely reached the young man's ears before he was down the bank and across the river. But when he reached the alder, neither Alison nor Janet nor the old beldame were to be seen. The terrible conviction that she had been carried off by Mother Demdike then smote him, and though he continued his search for her among the adjoining bushes, it was with fearful misgivings. No answer was returned by his shouts, nor could he discover any trace of the means by which Alison had been spirited away. After some time spent in ineffectual search, uncertain what course to pursue, and with a heart full of despair, Richard crossed the river and proceeded towards the house, in front of which he found Mistress Nutter and Nicholas, both of whom seemed surprised when they perceived he was unaccompanied by Alison. The lady immediately and somewhat sharply questioned him as to what had become of her adopted daughter, and appeared at first to doubt his answer. But at length, unable to question his sincerity, she became violently agitated. "'The poor girl has been conveyed away by Mother Demdike,' she cried, "'though for what purpose I am at a loss to conceive. The old hag could not cross the running water, and therefore resorted to that stratagem.' "'Alison must not be left in her hands, madam,' said Richard. "'She must not,' replied the lady. "'If Blackadder, whom I have sent after Parson Holden, were here, "'I would dispatch him instantly to Malkin Tower.' "'I will go instead,' said Richard. "'You had better accept his offer,' interposed Nicholas. "'He will serve you as well as Blackadder.' "'Go I shall, madam,' cried Richard, "'if not on your account, on my own.' "'Come with me, then,' said the lady, entering the house, "'and I will furnish you with that which shall be your safeguard in the enterprise.' With this she proceeded to the closet where her interview with Roger Nowell had been held, and, unlocking an ebony cabinet, 
took from a drawer within it a small flat piece of gold, graven with mystic characters, and having a slender chain of the same metal attached to it. Throwing this chain over Richard's neck, she said, "'Place this talisman, which is of sovereign virtue, near your heart, and no witchcraft shall have power over you. But be careful that you are not by any artifice deprived of it, for the old hag will soon discover that you possess some charm to protect you against her spells. You are impatient to be gone, but I have not yet done,' she continued, taking down a small silver bugle from a hook, and giving it him. "'On reaching Malkin Tower, wind this horn thrice, and the old witch will appear at the upper window. Demand admittance in my name, and she will not dare to refuse you. Or, if she does, tell her you know the secret entrance to her stronghold, and will have recourse to it. And in case this should be needful, I will now disclose it to you. But you must not use it till other means fail.' When opposite the door, which you will find is high up in the building, take ten paces to the left, and if you examine the masonry at the foot of the tower, you will perceive one stone somewhat darker than the rest. At the bottom of this stone, and concealed by a patch of heath, you will discover a knob of iron. Touch it, and it will give you an opening to a vaulted chamber, whence you may mount to the upper room. Even then you may experience some difficulty, but with resolution you will surmount all obstacles. "'I have no fear of success, madam,' replied Richard confidently. And quitting her, he proceeded to the stables, and calling for his horse, vaulted into the saddle, and galloped off towards the bridge. Fast as Richard rode up the steep hillside, still faster did the black clouds gather over his head, no natural cause could have produced so instantaneous a change in the aspect of the sky, and the young man viewed it with uneasiness, and wished to get out of the thicket in which he was now involved before the threatened thunderstorm commenced. But the hill was steep, and the road bad, being full of loose stones, and crossed in many places by bare roots of trees. Though ordinarily sure-footed, Merlin stumbled frequently, and Richard was obliged to slacken his pace. It grew darker and darker, and the storm seemed ready to burst upon him. The smaller birds ceased singing, and screened themselves under the thickest foliage. The pie chattered incessantly, the jay screamed, the bittern blew past, booming heavily in the air, the raven croaked, the heron arose from the river, and speeded off, with his long neck stretched out, and the falcon, who had been hovering over him, swept sidelong down, and sought shelter beneath an impending rock. The rabbit scuttered off to his burrow in the brake, and the hare, erecting himself for a moment, as if to listen to the note of danger, crept timorously off into the long dry grass. It grew so dark at last that the road was difficult to discern, and the dense rows of trees on either side assumed a fantastic appearance in the deep gloom. Richard was now more than halfway up the hill and the thicket had become more tangled and intricate, and the road narrower and more rugged. All at once Merlin stopped, quivering in every limb, as if in extremity of terror. Before the rider, and right in his path, glared a pair of red fiery orbs, with something dusky and obscured linked to them, but whether of man or beast he could not distinguish. Richard called to it. No answer. He stuck spurs into the reeking flanks of his horse. The animal refused to stir. Just then there was a moaning sound in the wood, as of some one in pain. He turned in the direction, shouted, but received no answer. When he looked back, the red eyes were gone. Then Merlin moved forward of his own accord, but ere he had gone far, the eyes were visible again, glaring at the rider from the wood. This time they approached, dilating and increasing in growing intensity, till they scorched him like burning glasses. Bethinking him of the talisman, Richard drew it forth. The light was instantly extinguished, and the indistinct figure accompanying it melted into darkness. Once more Merlin resumed his toilsome way, and Richard was marvelling that the storm so long suspended its fury, when the sky was riven by a sudden blaze, and a crackling bolt shot down and struck the earth at his feet. 
the affrighted steed reared aloft, and was with difficulty prevented from falling backwards upon his rider. Almost before he could be brought to his feet, an awful peal of thunder burst overhead, and it required Richard's utmost efforts to prevent him from rushing madly down the hill. The storm had now fairly commenced. Flash followed flash, and peal succeeded peal, without intermission. The rain descended, hissing and spouting, and presently ran down the hill in a torrent, adding to the horseman's other difficulties and dangers. To heighten the terror of the scene, strange shapes, revealed by the lightning, were seen flitting among the trees, and strange sounds were heard, though overpowered by the dreadful rolling of the thunder. But Richard's resolution continued unshaken, and he forced Merlin on. He had not proceeded far, however, when the animal uttered a cry of fright, and began beating the air with his forehoofs. The lightning enabled Richard to discern the cause of this new distress. Coiled round the poor beast's legs, all whose efforts to disengage himself from the terrible assailant were ineffectual, was a large black snake, seemingly about to plunge its poisonous fangs into the flesh. Again having recourse to the talisman, and bending down, Richard stretched it towards the snake, upon which the reptile instantly darted its arrow-shaped head against him, but instead of wounding him its forked teeth encountered the piece of gold, and if stricken a violent blow, it swiftly untwined itself and fled, hissing into the thicket. Richard was now obliged to dismount and lead his horse. In this way he toiled slowly up the hill. The storm continued with unabated fury, the red lightning played around him, the rattling thunder stunned him, and the pelting rain poured down upon his head. But he was no more molested. Save for the vivid flashes, it had become dark as night, but they served to guide him on his way. At length he got out of the thicket, and trod upon the turf, but it was rendered so slippery by moisture that he could scarcely keep his feet while the lightning no longer aided him. Fearing he had taken a wrong course, he stood still, and while debating with himself, a blaze of light illumined the wide heath, and showed him the object of his search. Malkin Tower, standing alone like a beacon, at about a quarter of a mile's distance, on the further side of the hill. Was it disturbed fancy, or did he really behold on the summit of the structure a grisly shape resembling— if it resembled anything human, a gigantic black cat, with roughened staring skin and flaming eyeballs. Nerved by the sight of the tower, Richard was on his steed's back in an instant, and the animal, having in some degree recovered his spirits, galloped off with him, and kept his feet in spite of the slippery state of the road. Ere long another flash showed the young man that he was drawing rapidly near the tower, and dismounting, he tied Merlin to a tree, and hurried towards the unhallowed pile. When within twenty paces of it, mindful of Mistress Nutter's injunctions, he placed the bugle to his lips, and winded it thrice. The summons, though clear and loud, sounded strangely in the portentous silence. Scarcely had the last notes died away, when a light shone through the dark red curtains hanging before a casement in the upper part of the tower. The next moment these were drawn aside, and a face appeared, so frightful, so charged with infernal wickedness and malice, that Richard's blood grew chill at the sight. Was it man or woman? The white beard and the large, broad, masculine character of the countenance seemed to denote the former, but the garb was that of a female. The face was at once hideous and fantastic, the eyes set across, the mouth awry, the right cheek marked by a mole shining with black hair, and horrible from its contrast to the rest of the visage, and the brow branded as if by a streak of blood. A black thrum cape constituted the old witch's headgear, and from beneath it her hoary hair escaped in long elf-locks. The lower part of her person was hidden from view, but she appeared to be as broad-shouldered as a man, and her bulky person was wrapped in a tawny-coloured robe. Throwing open the window, she looked forth and demanded in harsh, imperious tones, "'How dares to summon Mother Demdike?' "'A messenger from Mistress Nutter,' 
replied Richard. "'I am come in her name to demand the restitution of Alison Device, whom thou hast forcibly and wrongfully taken from her. Alison Device is my granddaughter, and as such belongs to me, and not to Mistress Nutter,' rejoined Mother Demdike. "'Thou knowest thou speakest false, foul hag,' cried Richard. "'Alison is no blood of thine.' "'Open the door, and cast down the ladder, or I will find other means of entrance.' "'Try them, then,' rejoined Mother Demdike, and she closed the casement sharply, and drew the curtains over it. After reconnoitring the building for a moment, Richard moved quickly to the left, and, counting ten paces as directed by Mistress Nutter, began to search among the thick grass growing near the base of the tower for the concealed entrance. It was too dark to distinguish any difference in the colour of the masonry, but he was sure he could not be far wrong, and presently his hand came in contact with a knob of iron. He pressed it, but it did not yield to the touch. Again more forcibly, but with like ill success. Could he be mistaken? He tried the next stone, and discovered another knob upon it, but this was as immovable as the first. He went on, and then found that each stone was alike, and that if, among the number, he had chanced upon the one worked by the secret spring, it had refused to act. On examining the structure so far as he was able to do in the gloom, he found he had described the whole circle of the tower, and was about to commence the search anew, when a creaking sound was heard above, and a light streamed suddenly down upon him. The door had been opened by the old witch, and she stood there, with a lamp in her hand, the yellow flame illumining her hideous visage, and short, square, powerfully built frame. Her throat was like that of a bull, her hands of extraordinary size, and her arms, which were bare to the shoulder, brawny and muscular. "'What? Still outside?' she cried, in a jeering tone, and with a wild, discordant laugh. "'Methought thou affirmest thou shalt find a way into my dwelling.' "'I do not yet despair of finding it,' replied Richard. "'Fool!' screamed the hag. "'I tell thee it is in vain to attempt it without my consent. "'With a word I could make the walls one solid mass without window or outlet from base to summit. "'With a word I could shower stones upon thy head and crush thee to dust.' With a word I could make the earth swallow thee up. With a word I could whisk thee hence to the top of Pendle Hill. <laughs> Dost fear me now? No, replied Richard undauntedly, and the word thou menacest me with shall never be uttered. Why not? asked Mother Demdike derisively. Because thou wouldst not brave the resentment of one whose power is equal to thine own, if not greater replied the young man. Yeah, "'Greater it is not, neither equal,' rejoined the old hag haughtily. "'But I do not desire a quarrel with Alice Nutter. Only let her not meddle with me.' "'Once more art thou willing to admit me?' demanded Richard. "'Aye, upon one condition,' replied Mother Demdike. "'Thou shalt learn it anon.' "'Stand aside while I let down the ladder.' Richard obeyed, and a pair of narrow wooden steps dropped to the ground. "'Now mount, if thou hast the courage,' cried the hag. The young man was instantly beside her, but she stood in the doorway, and barred his further progress with her extended staff. Now that he was face to face with her, he wondered at his own temerity. There was nothing human in her countenance and infernal light gleamed in her strangely set eyes. Her personal strength, evidently unimpaired by age, or preserved by magical art, seemed equal to her malice, and she appeared as capable of executing any atrocity as of conceiving it. She saw the effect produced upon him, and chuckled with malicious satisfaction. "'Sawst thou ever a face like mine?' she cried. "'No, I wot not.' "'But I would rather inspire aversion and terror than love. "'Love? <laughs> I would rather see men shrink from me and shudder at my approach "'than smile upon me and court me. "'I would rather freeze the blood in their veins 
and set it boiling with passion. <laughs> "'Thou art a fearful being, indeed!' exclaimed Richard, appalled. "'Fearful am I!' ejaculated the old witch, with renewed laughter. "'At least thou earnest it. Why, I, I am fearful. It is my wish to be so. I live to plague mankind, to blight and blast them, to scare them with my looks, to work them mischief. <laughs> and now let us look at thee,' she continued, holding the lamp over him. "'Why, sir, a comely youth, <laughs> and the young maids dote upon thee, I doubt not, and praise thy blooming cheeks, thy bright eyes, thy flowing locks, and thy fine limbs. I hate thy beauty, boy, and would mar it, would canker thy wholesome flesh, dim thy lustrous eyes, and strike thy vigorous limbs with palsy, till they would shake like mine.' "'I'm half a minded to do it,' she added, raising her staff and glaring at him with inconceivable malignity. "'Hold!' exclaimed Richard, taking the talisman from his breast and displaying it to her. "'I am armed against thy malice.' Mother Demdike's staff fell from her grasp. "'I knew thou wert in some way protected,' she cried furiously, "'and so—' "'It is a piece of gold with magic characters upon it. "'Ah!' she added, suddenly changing her tone. "'Let me look at it.' "'Thou seest it plain enough,' rejoined Richard. "'Now stand aside and let me pass, "'for thou perceivest I have power to force an entrance.' "'I see it, I see it,' replied Mother Demdike, with affected humility. "'I see it is in vain to struggle with thee, or, or rather with the potent lady who sent thee. Tarry where thou art, and I will bring Alison to thee.' "'I almost mistrust thee,' said Richard. "'But be speedy.' "'I will be scarce a moment,' said the witch. "'But I must warn thee that she is—' "'What? What hast thou done to her, thou wicked hag?' cried Richard in alarm. Oh, "'She is distraught,' said Mother Demdike. "'Distraught?' echoed Richard. "'But thou canst easily cure her,' said the old hag, significantly. "'Aye, so I can,' cried Richard, with sudden joy. "'The talisman! Bring her to me at once!' Mother Demdike departed, leaving him in a state of indescribable agitation. The walls of the tower were of immense thickness, and the entrance to the chamber towards which the arched doorway led was covered by a curtain of old arras, behind which the hag had disappeared. Scarcely had she entered the room when a scream was heard, and Richard heard his own name pronounced by a voice which, in spite of its agonised tones, he at once recognised. The cries were repeated, and he then heard Mother Demdike call out, "'Come hither! Come hither!' Instantly rushing forward, and dashing aside the tapestry, he found himself in a mysterious-looking circular chamber, with a massive oak table in the midst of it. There were many strange objects in the room, but he saw only Alison, who was struggling with the old witch, and clinging desperately to the table. He called to her by name as he advanced, but her bewildered looks proved that she did not know him. "'Alison, dear Alison, I have come to free you!' he exclaimed, but in place of answering him she uttered a piercing scream. "'The talisman! The talisman!' cried the hag. "'I cannot undo my own work. Place the chain round her neck and the gold near her heart, that she may experience its full virtue.' Richard unsuspectingly complied with the suggestion of the temptress, but the moment he had parted with the piece of gold the figure of Alison vanished. The chamber was buried in gloom, and amidst a hubbub of wild laughter he was dragged by the powerful arm of the witch through the arched doorway, and flung from it to the ground, the shock of the fall producing immediate insensibility. End of chapter 11